This, in fact, is Kylie Pine right here to my left. Um, Kylie and I have known each other for years, right? But we sat down and talked about how much we know about each other, and it's actually very little. We went to the same church. Her parents are wonderful. Kylie's wonderful. She went into this area of study. I had no idea why. So she just told me a little bit about that and said that she worked at the museum in high school. And she said it was a place where when people asked her questions, they listened to her answers and treated her like a, an adult. <laughs> and then she went to Willamette. And at Willamette, um, you worked where? worked at Halley Ford. So after her uh, graduation, she went off to the University of Washington and did a master's degree program in museum studies, I think you said, right? So she's grown up in Salem and she's back here and I think we're very lucky to have her. Um, she's going to uh, talk on a couple of things today and she'll be available for questions. Some of the things that we may like to know about that aren't in her talk include um, what kinds of collections she curates, and what they are and where they are, just briefly. I also uh, was told that she's just finished working on a, an exhibit. And so I wondered also, well, where are the exhibits and what are they about? And she maybe be, will be able to talk a little bit about that. Um, she's also on the board of the Oregon State Museum of Mental Health. So I said, well, where's that? And she said, well, duh, it's at the state hospital. Where do you think? <laughs> um, and, and she teaches a course at Western Oregon University. So she's a very busy person, and we're very lucky to have her. So I introduce to you now Kylie Pine. Good afternoon, everybody. I have to say that this has been on my bucket list for a very long time, and I'm just delighted to have been asked to be able to share with you all, and I'm delighted to see so many familiar faces as well. Um, I thought I wanted this, but now I don't think I do. Whoa. All right, <laughs> it's a little bit more solid. <laughs> so um, I am lucky that I get to um, entertain you, hopefully not bore you to death for two hours. Woo! <laughs> So the first part of the talk is going to be a little bit more interactive, and it's going to be kind of a uh, pop quiz for you all about how familiar you, you are with Salem history, and um, what Salem looked like 100 years ago. And then we're going to go and we're going to do a little bit of a virtual walk around the block, seeing as that you all come here twice a week and see if we can illuminate some of the history of this space and this place in particular. So um, with that, I'm just going to get going. <laughs> So um, I'm, yeah, uh, I'm going to confess that sitting and listening to people talk is not my favorite thing to do. So um, I'm hoping this is going to be a little bit more interactive. That might be a little more complicated with the mic and question thing, but we'll make it work as we go along. And that the questions that I'm going to ask you during this presentation are not necessarily rhetorical. Um, I'd like you to answer out, yell out the answers, and let's, let's have a good time as we go through. So to start out and to demonstrate that fact, does anybody recognize this snowy scene from Salem 100 years ago? What are we looking at? State Street. State Street, very good. Oh, man, you guys are so good. This is going to be so easy. The Methodist Church. So yeah, we've got some clues. There you go. From the Presbyterian, the Methodist Church identification. That's pretty good. So we can kind of see in the red circle now the outlines of the Capitol building and the Methodist Church steeple that's very still, still visible. And of course, today, this is what State Street looks like. You can still see the Methodist Church steeple in the, in the background, although the Capitol has been moved a little bit. All right. So... Um, how many people have been watching the Ken Burns documentary on country music? Me too. I love it. I love Ken Burns. I love country music. But I noticed as I was watching that uh, documentary a few days ago that there was one thing that was really just getting my goat. There were these beautiful pictures from all over history, and there was not a single citation on any one of those pictures, and it just drove me 
bananas. So as we go through the presentation, you may notice that there are some random numbers around. Um, I tried to caption them, although I ran out of a little bit of time, so my captions aren't super great. Um, hypocrite me, there you go. But there will be numbers along there. Those are my reference numbers for our collections of photographs. Uh, I'll throw this one in here, Jim, for you. We have about 200,000 photographs at the museum that we take care of, and one of the ways that we track them is through this numbering system. And the hope is then when you say, hey, Kylie, remember that picture from State Street that you showed us at the presentation? I'll be like, no, not really, but let's go back. <laughs> and then I can pull up that number and find that picture immediately, rather than have to go through the 300 pictures of State Street that we have in the collection. That way. So if you see those numbers, that's what they are. Um, so just a note about sources. Uh, I like, uh, one of my favorite sources at the Willamette Heritage Center are city directories. Are people familiar with city directories? Some people are. So think phone books before there were phones. <laughs> and they are just a wealth of knowledge. So today's presentation, and the reason why it's 100-ish years ago, is really going to be based off of the information that I was able to find in this city directory, which, as you note, is from 1917. Unfortunately, I don't have a 1919 one, so we're going to do 100 years-ish <laughs> as we go through looking at those things. And as the city directory itself states, the facts herein set forth are authentic and can be relied upon. Um, shh, maybe. <laughs> so a lot of the stuff is coming from this directory, and that's, that's the main source, and will be supplemented through pictures and other things. So for those who haven't seen a city directory, this is what it looks like. We'll get it a little bit bigger. I wasn't sure how it's easy to see. But it gives the person's name. It gives their uh, occupation. Hannah here is a spooler at the TKWM Co., which I happen to know is the Thomas K. Woolen Mill Company, and that she rooms, meaning she's renting, at 478 South 16th Street. So if you're doing research on genealogy or other people, this is a great way to track them um, through time and space um, in our city. Uh, I've got another one I just underlined because I like Jacob, and that he's a watchman at the Hunt Brothers Co uh, Company cannery, and that he resides, R-E-S resides, instead of rooms at 687 Front Street. So you get an idea what we're working with. Uh, also, for this presentation, we've, we pulled out our newspaper archives and some photographic collections and other things as announced. So there you go. That's my two cents. Ken Burns, take that. <laughs> so 100 years ago, what did Salem look like? Anybody care to guess how many people were living in Salem 100 years ago, 1919? 8,000. 8,000? Yeah. 10? Uh, <laughs> 18,800 based and this census information was based upon the school census so um, counting people that had kids and their parents and then adjusting that way so it may be accurate I don't know if that's the best way to censusize is that a verb count people in a community um, but that's that's where we're at 1800 so Salem was known for its beautiful civic center and large public buildings. Um, in fact, the city directory loved to say that the public buildings grouped in the heart of Salem form a magnificent business center, all of which are surrounded by spacious grounds interwoven with broad flower bordered walks. Um, Salem hasn't exactly had its best track record for retaining historic buildings um, over time. And in fact, of all of these buildings that we're going to go through, the seven that are listed as the beautiful Civic Center, only one still exists in its same location doing its same purpose. So we'll go through and see how many you recognize. Ooh, I love the argument. <laughs> so I've heard courthouse, city hall, now parking lot. Well, there you go. You guys don't need me up here. You got it all. So this is Salem City Hall, as was. Um, it housed everything from the city government offices to the police department and the fire department um, at one point in time in this one building. We were a little bit smaller of a town back then. But as mentioned, it is now a parking lot at the corner of Chemeketa and High Streets today. There is, however, if you walk by, a little plaque commemorating um, the original City Hall building there. All right, next, next one. There we go. We got the courthouse this time. <laughs> so this is the Marion County Courthouse, um, which was replaced with this lovely structure 
a little bit while later. I shouldn't comment, it's very functional, and that other one was falling down, but one of the reasons the Marion County Historical Society, now Willamette Heritage Center, was created was because of the tearing down of this building. So um, there was fight back, it just didn't necessarily work. Um, okay, Marion County Courthouse, this building. It is, it is Gadke Hall now. It was the post office. It's actually described in 1917 as the federal building, as in addition to its offices as a United States post office. It also had some other federal, federal duties that it was doing. This was actually located next to the Capitol building <laughs> um, and was famously picked up off of its foundation and moved down State Street to its current location, which is now on the corner of 12th and State Streets. That would be the south west corner of 12th and State Streets, and looks like this today. Um, <laughs> Capitol building? All right, yeah, it is the Capitol building, which was uh, famously lost in a very beautiful conflagration in the 1930s. Um, it's fun listening to the oral histories of folks that watched it. Did anybody here watch the Capitol burn? It's not that strange. <laughs> I, my grandmother watched it and she used to tell me the stories about it and how because of the copper in the dome, the flames took on a very interesting hue and how the massive amounts of state documents within here um, went up in the flames and littered Salem like a snowstorm <laughs> as they came around and people picked it up for um, all sorts of souvenirs and those types of things. Um, I think my favorite capital burning story, though, came from Dr. John Griffiths. Did anybody know Dr. Griffiths? His story was that he had just finished reading about the disaster at Pompeii when this happened. And so you could find him that day hiding in the back room, sure that the fate was about to hit him as well <laughs> with the fiery thing. But there you go. And of course, today the Capitol looks a lot different. Um, this building? The Carnegie Library. Yeah, you guys are good. <laughs> Can't trick you guys. Yep, so this is located now. It's part of Willamette University's campus and the law school and the law library. But at the time, it was the Carnegie Library, um, made famous by that billionaire giving out money to library purposes. This is story time in the basement of the Carnegie Library, about 1912, so you'll have to forgive me the date. But how cute is that? <laughs> Those kids. And finally, Supreme Court building, and this one is the last building of that beautiful, magnificent Civic Center that is still standing in its same location and still uses its same purpose as well. All the rest have been destroyed, moved, or otherwise occupied. Yeah, remodeled. Yeah, it was remodeled, that's true. All right, so state institutions, back in, back in 1919, you're looking at this list of state institutions, um, many of which uh, it's, I think, interesting to think about are still around and still occupying much of their original structures. Um, it's a, some pretty old infrastructure we've got going on as well. The, the last of the, the state institutions also, yeah, um, they lied and they, they listed Shamawa as a state institution. It was not a state institution, it was a federal institution, but you know, what can you do? The city directory put it there, so I did too. Um, so this is the last state institution they were talking about. Does anybody recognize this state institution? TB Hospital, yes, which was built and was considered the most magnificent of its kind and the only state-run TB Hospital in the Pacific Northwest when it was built. Now it is Corbin University. I can't trick any of you guys. Man, usually I have a harder, <laughs> an easier time. <laughs> so um, I was hoping there would be a board, but I will just make it work here. It's time for a little bit of major industries, trivial person. No, what's the one where they list out the things and you're supposed to figure it out? I don't remember. We're playing a game. So what do you think 100 years ago the major industries in, in Salem were? Lumber, okay, I gave you that one. <laughs> Lumber, what else? Farming, agriculture, okay. Textiles and wool. And making beer, did I hear? Beer, okay. Any other ideas? Fruit. I will say that I pulled the agricultural stuff out of this. This is just manufacturing and industry. 
We will talk about agriculture, I promise, because it was a big one. Textiles, wool. All right. Oh, I like fishing. Government. Well, according to the 1917 city directory, oops, maybe this will work. These were the, oh, is it gonna go every one of them? <laughs> Major industries, I guess I'm gonna click them all. Woo! <laughs> Batteries, two stove manufacturing plants, flour mills, cement and tile works, iron foundry, furnace mills, granite works, vinegar and cider works, etc. As far as, as those go, um, I, like, I like beer making as a thing, um, but I should note that by 1919, and in fact as early as 1914, Salem had voted to become a dry town and was bucking the natural tr national trend that would be to come. Uh, no alcohol could be consumed, although there was a provision that the Salem Brewery Association could brew um, and sell elsewhere, but by the time you hit this, they'd, they'd gone out of business. They couldn't do that. <laughs> it didn't work as well. So, yeah. Uh, so from those industries, the city had a monthly payroll, meaning all of the monies paid out to workers. And of course, this was listed in the city directory. Why wouldn't you? Any idea how much that was? A monthly payroll for all of the workers within the city of Salem. 3,000? Oh, wow. Well. 40,000? 200,000. <laughs> well, imagine, this is everybody's working. <laughs> Everybody in the city of Salem and their, their, their um, gross payroll. I was shocked. That seemed quite low to me. but <laughs> That's a month, a one month. But gives you a, a sense of how much money is flowing through there. So we talk a little bit of agriculture. Agriculture, huge part of uh, industry here in Salem. Um, these gentlemen represent the number one agricultural crop. And Oregon was famous for this crop within this the State of the Union, and it's a little <laughs> ironic given our conversation about prohibition. Hops. Hops. <laughs> hops. These are hops brokers. Um, hops was a big industry. Four million dollars a year flowed through Salem because of the hops industry. And imagine four million dollars are there and payroll receipts are 200,000. <laughs> that's a lot of business that's going through there. Um, yep, hops. Another really big industry, flax. Flax makes linen um, and other things. <laughs> um, it was also used a lot in the fishing industry up in Alaska. Surprisingly enough, Oregon flax was to make netting and other things. Yeah, huge industry, mostly supported through the flax processing plant at the state penitentiary. And it was actually state funded um, and put together. Uh, it was a way to keep inmates moving and doing things um, and also a way to process a crop and take it out there. And of course, you lay the flax out in the fields in these little cones, and it's very distinctive as you go through. So in terms of production, statewide production, Salem ranked first in hops, flax, prunes, oats, loganberries, and onion sets. Uh, oh, well, you can see that I did this quite late last night. So second, instead of two firsts, <laughs> in potatoes, pears, and raspberries, third in walnuts and clover, and fourth in cherries and quinces. Now, if you all know that our nick moniker nickname is the Cherry City, came because of the cherry production, but we weren't first in cherry production. In fact, that led the first city in, in Hood River to uh, derisively state that Salem should be called the prune capital of the world because of the massive amounts of Italian prunes that were being grown and processed here in, in, the, in the city. Um, surprising. Hazelnuts. You know, the industry didn't, didn't grow until later. Um, these, were the, these were the top grocers for that, this point in time. I don't know about later. I don't know a whole lot more about it. But it is a good industry, and I know it's growing even more now. People are putting a lot more acreage into hazelnuts because of the profitability of them. So, all right, there's agriculture. Transportation, pop quiz, how many trains were coming in and out of Salem on a daily basis in 1919? Well, actually, 1917, technically. Oh, you guys are good. 
and I got to do my math. Okay, so 12 and 20 make 32, and 10 make 42. 42 trains, 12 daily trains to and from Salem on the SP line, which was the regular um, steam train line, and then 20 daily trains to and from Salem uh, going northwards on the Oregon Electric line, the inner urban line, and 10 going down to Albany. Can you imagine how different our public transportation would be with 42 daily trains coming in and out of town? This is the depot, um, obviously the old depot, this picture's a little older, sorry, because the new depot, the one that you see now, was built in 1918, um, but it shows one of those great cars. I just love this picture. Does anybody know what this car is called? Uh, sorry. Car. It's an electric car, and it's called, nicknamed, the skunk. I guess you can imagine why it might have been nicknamed the skunk. I just, the McKean Motor Company car. I just love it. Um, if you were catching the inner urban cars, you'd probably be going to this downtown building, which still stands. It's the Hubbard Building or the Oregon Building. Uh, Willamette Valley Music Company is down in the basement now. Um, in the southwest corner of High and State Streets. But this was the hub for the Oregon Electric Company and the, where their, their depot was, so you could catch your train there. And as you can see, their train's coming right up High Street there. Uh, and Salem had a, a streetcar as well that would take you around different places. And you could see the streetcar tracks. This is commercial looking north, um, and the tracks inside there as well. Um, roads were up and coming at the time. Uh, the city directory is proud to announce that there were, oh man, I wrote down the number, but I didn't write it down here. Where is it? 25 miles of paved or surfaced roads in the city of Salem at this point in time, which is good. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you guess what that means. <laughs> Maybe it's a wannabe paved road as it goes through. And of course, we had a modern water, water system to be able to supply the city of Salem. Running water was a must. Where was the water being drawn from, though? The Willamette, but not just the Willamette. The slough, slu. I'll be able to say it, <laughs> Slew. Yeah, there were cradles that were stuck right in down there. This is the pumping plant that stood um, at the corner of Commercial Street, and I think it's Ferry or Trade, it's probably Trade at that point in time. Um, right now, it's um, there's a, when the beautiful menorah gets put up at Christmas time, or at Hanukkah time, um, in this corner there, there's a little place outside of the fire department. That's where this pumping plant was. And it would sit there and it pumped water out of the Willamette for all of us to drink. Needless to say, people did not think it was super sanitary, and it wasn't. Um, so they decided to, in the 20s and 30s, or change the way that they brought the water down from the mountain water sources that they use today. But ironically, when we had all that water scare a little while ago, guess what they started talking about? <laughs> Pumping that water out of the Willamette. I think, ah, uh, history, it just comes full circle. <laughs> just, just go ahead and wait. So in education, uh, there were one high school here in Salem, and three junior highs, and nine public grade schools. Any ideas which ones they were? Many of them are still in use today. Garfield? McKinley? Parish wasn't built yet. Englewood, yes. Not Bush. Richmond, yes. Salem Heights, yes. I didn't count West Salem because technically, at this point in time, West Salem is not part of Salem yet. Got to wait till the 40s when Salem decides they need some other um, things that they Maybe hostily take it over, maybe not. <laughs> so yeah, here's your schools. The grayed out ones are the ones that no longer exist. Uh, the other ones are ones that do. While they say they have three grades or three junior highs, actually they were part of the grade schools as well. There were no separate buildings made for for the um, the junior highs at that time. So an interesting idea too. How much of our education stock is still working that direction? This was Salem High School. Does not look probably very familiar if you're thinking about North Salem High School, where Salem High School got moved to. That was a works project administration building. This one stood downtown, 
where Macy's stands today, or Myron Frank, if you will. Uh, in fact, the building was raised and, and moved when, um, I take that back. I don't actually know when the building was raised. It was moved quite, quite a bit before because um, Myron Frank came in at about 1954-ish. Take that back. So yes, this is where it was. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> You also had some other alternative schooling opportunities if you were living in Salem at the time. You could go to this school. Sacred Heart, I heard it out there, <laughs> Sacred Heart, uh, which was located downtown. Uh, this is St. Joe's today. This is the parking lot next to St. Joe's uh, where the school was located for many years. You might also try your higher education um, opportunities through a trade school like the Capital Business College, who boasted a very famous alumnus Anybody recognize, know who was an alumnus of Capital Business College? Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover, you are right. <laughs> Herbert Hoover took night classes there when he was working as a conductor for the street, or street railroad system here in Salem before going off to Stanford and doing other things way again. <laughs> Later there, um, this is located at High and Ferry Streets at this point in time in its history. It moved around a lot, which is about right there today. Uh, also, if you were of a different kind of bend, you might be going to the Fish School of Expression, which is my new favorite school in Salem at the time. <laughs> yeah, anyways. <laughs> uh, so, entertainment-wise, you might be going out to uh, the movies. There were uh, one theater theater advertised, but also three moving picture theaters advertised at this point in time. Quick true or false question, people would stay home 100 years ago in the evening and listen to radio broadcasts to get their news and their entertainment. False. <laughs> as much as I cannot believe this, radio broadcasts did not start until 1921 in the state of Oregon. That's less, less than 100 years ago, something that I just think about a lot as Part of, part of that part of the history? Not quite yet. <laughs> Almost a century year old. old. And then a couple of the other uh, fun um, businesses that you might not recognize. Um, the drugless physicians. Um, lots of interesting ways to, to um, treat yourself in the Hydroelectric Therapeutic Institute. Um, she did a lot of advertising. I thought this one was just fascinating. And you see this a lot with the transition. The automo first or automobile came to Salem in 1903. Um, and this was steadily changing. Um, and you see a lot of the businesses that started out as carriage trimmers or um, carriage sellers starting to make the transition between horses and automobiles. And you see this in garages too. A lot of the livery stations that had been, um, you've been housing and boarding your houses in are turning into garages <laughs> where you can park your car. Um, I just find that fascinating as part of that transition. I don't know about you, but this was a huge industry in Salem for a long time, and I can't quite figure it out. At one point in time, there were up to seven manufacturers of cigars in the city of Salem. Why? We're not growing a whole lot of tobacco. I, don't, I mean, there are maybe a little bit, but it's more of a novelty crop than anything else. I don't know why, maybe it was hard to get cigars in here, maybe they're better fresh, I don't smoke cigars, I don't know. Um, but yeah, a whole bunch of cigar manufacturers, even up to this point in time. Crazy. Oh, so that was a quick trip through Salem in 1919, 100 years ago. Does anybody have any questions or responses or ideas? Things you wanna talk about? Oh, I gotta wait for the microphone, sorry. I'm trainable. I noticed on the city directory the price was six dollars. A hundred years ago, six dollars would have been awesome. Is that how many people bought it? Not enough. How's <laughs> that? <laughs> um, I, I mean, as I said before, I rely on these city directories, and there's a lot that we don't have. Um, and one of the things I'm really nervous about with the library closing for two years is they've got the best collection in the city of Salem and there's not a plan in place yet to um, how those are gonna be dealt with um, during that time, if we can even get at them. We have a fairly big collection, the state library has a fairly big collection, but there are some of the early ones that just didn't survive that long. <laughs> um, I, 
I don't have a good answer for you, but I wish more people bought them. But they were in very, I mean, this is, for a business, can you imagine? It has, in addition to the listing of everybody there, it also has the, the yellow pages, if you will, of um, all the industries. So I want to go buy a shirt waist and a dress. How do I get there? Oh, here are the people that are selling it, and this is where I can find them. Pre-internet, that's the way to go. <laughs> so a vital, vital part of industry. Hi, this is Karen. Hi, Karen. Uh, so with what seemed like a lot of train trips, north, south, all over, why didn't that develop and continue, and why don't we have rail as a major or um, any major way of transportation from here to Portland or, or the, the, the streetcars or any of that? Why doesn't it exist anymore? I will preface this with that I am not an expert, but I have some theories based on some research that others have done, and it mostly relates to the streetcar, um, the, the disappearance of the streetcar in the city of Salem, and I think can probably be extrapolated to major rail service elsewhere. Um, if you think about the structure of rail industry, the railroads create their tracks, maintain them, and, and, and do their transporting thing. If you think about automobiles and buses, what kind of infrastructure do they not have to maintain? The roads, which are government subsidized through our taxpayer dollars, basically, right? That's a huge deal when you're talking about um, a, a pricing, too. So it's a lot cheaper for a company, um, not regardless of opportunity costs and other things out there too. But from a bottom line kind of, kind of standpoint, if I can take away that infrastructure maintenance fees, um, now it's the government that's taking care of the roads, all I have to do is provide a bus and a driver. I don't have to deal with the cars and the, and, and, or the, the trackage and that type of thing. So I don't know if you can exactly extrapolate that to the, the longer distance. And rail travel was still pretty popular up into, um, up into probably the 60s and 70s. Well, 70s is probably when we started seeing a, a bit of a decline, um, especially for long-term transportation. Hi, this is Pat. Uh, here hey, I Pat. am. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was wondering about, I didn't see Garfield up there. Um, wasn't that was a grade school? It is, it is I, I'm pretty sure it was there, but we'll find it. And the building is still standing, even though, has it changed? I mean, as of like it, a couple months ago. There are some attorneys in there. I don't know who else. There we go. Yeah, so still standing, oh, but it's it not a school. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes, and I was wondering, it had the state hospital for the, the insane, and then they had under that feeble-minded. What's the difference? Feeble was not quite there to be crazy? So um, all of these are, are terms that we don't use anymore. Um, but the, the, the school for the feeble-minded, as it was terminology in 1917, um, became Fairview. And the differentiation between um, the patient population um, or survivor population, however you want to term it, um, is, is the type of um, diagnosis that they've been given. So typically, folks that were sent to Fairview had um, a developmental disability, um, a chronic type of thing. Although we see in the admissions registers there that uh, a lot of kids that were diagnosed with uh, um, epilepsy um, in a time before there was ability to, to treat seizures in that way were also sent to, sent to Fairview as, um, as a, a a societal net type of thing for people that couldn't be kept, couldn't be cared for at home. Um, regardless of your thoughts about if that's the right thing to do or not, that's historically what was was said and, and done in that area. Joel here. Yeah, hey Joel. When my wife and I moved to Salem in 1963, <coughs> excuse me, there was a big sign out of, by the freeway where you came into the city that said Salem, all American city. All American city, and it was some kind of an award the city had won. Well, we moved into our house, <clears throat> and the neighbor was over knocking on the door, and, and she confirmed it. Yes, we're an all American city. We have no blacks living here. And that was in 1963. So I'm wondering, <clears throat> back in 1917, where your, your time period you're talking about, what was the ethnic breakdown? There had to be a community of Chinese here at that time. What else? Uh, what other? Uh, 
migrants were represented? Uh, lots. Salem was actually quite diverse um, in, in that type of sense, um, even though we know that uh, there were laws on Oregon's books and in its constitution up until about 1924 that excluded African Americans from living in the state. Um, we also know that that wasn't enforced as much as um, the laws were there. Um, there were a number of people. Uh, one of my favorite families is the Gorman family. Mr. Gorman, Hiram, came out. Oh, he was here by the 1890s, and he was employed by the Oregon Statesman as a pressman. So he was running the big um, rotary presses there. Um, his son um, was on the was a part of the fire department um, and was working on that. So we know no people of color lived in the city and were a vital and essential part of that. Um, in terms of uh, other types of ethnic groups that were here. Uh, the area around U Park and like 12th and Mission Street was known as, as Dutch Town for the large number of German and immigrants that were in that area at the time. Um, huge uh, swaths of folks from Belgium and other places speaking French in areas were here. Man, this is hard. This is like pop quiz for Kylie today. <laughs> how many? How, how much time do we have and how far can we get through? Um, there is uh, Salem, uh, so federally there was uh, acts that were passed in, in 1882, I think, the Chinese Exclusion Acts that prohibited people of Chinese ancestry from coming to the United States and did a lot of other things. Um, but Salem had a very large Chinese American population. Uh, they were not allowed to own property, which meant that they were often concentrated into areas where they could rent, and there was quite a bit of... of racism in the sense that they were pushed into these areas and not everybody would rent to them. Um, there's a description of one gentleman who uh, was forced to rent a nine by nine foot square building in basically this tenement house. Um, but, this, but if you can't own property and you're here and your, your citizenship status isn't allowed, you don't have a whole lot of recourse. Um, so, but we know from, from looking at maps that there were areas of, of Chinatown and that they often moved to around downtown um, because of this renter issue. Um, yeah, so a little bit more transient. Kylie, this is Jim. Hey, Jim. Hi. <laughs> Um, I, the first thing that came to my mind when you showed that the uh, payroll was 200000 a month was, I wonder what that translates to today in terms of today's dollars, and also per capita, perhaps, like dividing that number by the population, or if the statistics were available, the workforce, you know, who was getting this money, and then comparing it with today's payroll. That would be a great project. Uh, that's not what I'm going to be able to do in my head right now. <laughs> But I could, I mean, there are different ways that we could get about that. So how would we look towards finding sources that would be able to tell us that? Um, at the Thomas K. Woolen Mill across the street with the Willamette Heritage Center, we have payroll records that would be able to tell us about how much people were making a day. Um, and we could probably do some kind of uh, comparison where we would look at who was getting paid the most and who was getting paid the, the least and averaging that. And then pop, population-wise, think about how many people are working, how many people aren't. I, I think the other thing to keep in mind, too, is that for a very long time, there were two kind of classes of workers within Salem. There were people that were working in industry, getting a wage, and then there were agricultural workers, many of whom were farmers that were, I mean, they're not working in the same way that we're thinking. Uh, they're not getting a, a wage, they're selling their crop, and they're, they're subsisting a little bit more. So I think that might also adjust some of that number as well. When we talk about the Thomas K. Woolen Mill, we say that they, at one point in time, employed one-fifth or 20% of the non-farming population of the city of Salem. Um, and that's, that's, that's huge, but I'm also thinking, well, the non-farming, because there was some, so much agricultural work that was going on there, too. Yays. I, I recall my mother saying that she worked here as a teenager in the canneries, and they worked by the piece. And uh, I remember her talking about peeling pears, all of which just throws me for a loop. How on earth <laughs> did you peel very many pears? But she was always very quick with her hands. But I, I'm, what I'm thinking is that, too, if it's part of this calculation, might be a, a very different variable to have to consider for earnings. Yeah. My, my field of reference is 
pretty narrow, uh, but again, going back to the Thomas K. Woolen Mill, a lot of piecework was being done there. So not only are you being paid on your production, not on an hourly rate, but also you might be docked pay if there are errors in the work that you're doing as well. So again, yeah, to your point, definitely some different considerations in the way that labor laws are working at that time. So Kylie, I don't know if you want to take the break at this point or whether you have more to say the first half or what. I think we can take a break or if there's any more questions, I'm, uh, oh, I got a couple. Oh no. <laughs> Between Lee and Dan, I don't know. These are going to be hard questions. <laughs> no, no. I'm wondering if uh, the city of Salem has an official birthday by its founding or incorporation or some other way that, because we were supposed to have a birthday party, but it was in the middle of the recession. It was canceled, and I don't remember when uh, our actual birthday was. We have a state sesquicentennial uh, on Valentine's Day, but what about Salem? That's a great question. So Salem celebrated its centennial, 100th year anniversary, in 1940. How they came up with the idea that 1840 was the first part of Salem, I don't know. It was not incorporated at that point in time. But that's almost the time that Jason Lee and the Methodist Mission came and relocated to what would now be in within the city limits of Salem. But they had this big party, and they dressed up in pioneer clothes, and men wore beards, and, and did all that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, but like Abraham Lincoln kind of beards and, and chops and that type of thing. It was great, great party. Um, and we got some really interesting dresses in our collection, too, that were made for that centennial. And they're just a little off because they've got a zipper in them, and you know that there weren't any zippers in the 1840s. But um, <laughs> say again? Well, that's what I'm saying, is that it was kind of more a generic, this is kind of when Salem was founded, because Jason Lee's house wasn't even built until 1841, so they may have had kind of a, and I don't know if you can count that as incorporation. Um, the city of Salem's incorporation is a little bit fascinating, and I'm not going to be able to come up with years, but in the early 1850s, <laughs> to mid to late 1850s, uh, there were several bids because incorporation required a act of the legislature, the territorial legislature at the time. And so there was some legislation passed that said, oh yeah, you're incorporated. And then people contested it and went back and, um, and then it had to be redone. And they even hired their first mayor and they've elected their first alderman. And then it's like, oh no, this is unconstitutional and horrible and illegal. And then you can read lots of fighting in the newspapers. It's fascinating. So incorporation didn't happen until the 1850s. So I don't know. How do, you, how do you class when something was founded? Is it when people got here? Is it when you legally become an entity, uh, an, a corporate body? Um, yeah, legalism then. And then if you get contested, is it the first time you get the act passed or the second time you get the act passed and get all the signatures there? Um, it's a little bit more complex than that. And the answer is I talked a lot and I don't know the exact answer. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Hi, hey Dan. Dan. Hi, Dan. And I'm thinking that there is one state institution you missed that is actually um, still existing. The original building still exists today and in fact is for sale. Can you guess which one? No, tell me. Hillcrest, Hillcrest. School. It was, and I will say in my defense, it was not listed in the city directory, so it did not make it up on the screen. Um, and I don't know about the dates, but yeah, and it, tell I us more. I don't think it was called Hillcrest School then, either. It's probably State Training School for Girls or something to that, uh, that effect, yeah. I'm sorry, I just had to give you a little hard That's time. That's good, you can, you can give me hard time all you want. <laughs> Dan, thankfully, is one of our volunteers and comes and helps a lot, so he gets a lot of grace on that one. <laughs> Bear and, with us here, we're down to one mic for a few minutes. I would just like to say that you couldn't have a city established until the land was theirs. And the land was not theirs until the treaties were signed in 1855. That's fair. That's a good distinction. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between Willamette University then and the city. Ooh. Was there any relationship? Was there any relationship? Well, how much time do we have? <laughs> so, um, 
In order to tell this story properly, we've got to go back to 1841, when Jason Lee and his Methodist mission re-established their headquarters here in the Salem area proper. Um, so as missionaries, they were here early, um, and they were able to take part of uh, what was known as the donation land claim law, which gave settlers of certain elements. I mean, you had to have a lot of things. You had to be a white man and, and be here for all that type of thing. Um, 640 acres, if you're married, you get half, your wife gets half. Um, and the missionaries took advantage of these claims and claimed much of swath of what is now downtown Salem. Um, being civic-minded or otherwise, uh, they started platting the town and then also giving away land that they had claimed. Um, for civic opportunities. Um, one of those was for the Oregon Institute, which was a school that was formed by the missionaries for white children in the area in 1842. Um, and then we won't get into that, but there's a lot, lot of story there. Um, so they, they endowed this institution with a lot of land, which most of which became what is now Willamette University's campus. But the core group of missionaries, after a lot of squabbling and other things, also set aside land for the state government, for the city of Salem proper, and started selling off those things to support that. So in that sense, a lot of the, the naming of the city came from these missionaries. The um, original plan and layout of the city came from these missionaries or their descendants or son-in-laws or those types of things as they started uh, parceling out the money. So you get a lot of that in there. Is that kind of what you're looking at for in terms of connection? I just was wondering if the university and the city interacted between separate entities and got their business in I would say probably more of the latter in, in that term. Um, this Willamette University did not become a university until the 1850s when it was chartered by the state legislature again. It was more kind of a um, secondary school, a prep school for, for kids that were coming in and wanted something above the basic, um, basic elementary education that was being offered in other places, although that changed too as times, times changed. Um, I, I can't think of any instances where there was a lot of connection other than there's not a lot of p players in the pool at this point in time. So there's a lot of overlap in what's going on. Um, people's interests, I should say. Kylie, hello, George Adkins, Hi. back here. Hi, um, growing up in the 50s and 60s, there was a baseball diamond here. Uh, Salem had a, I suppose, a kind of a semi-pro but it was called Waters Field, Wooden Bleachers. It was a very cool place, I think, out on, uh, uh, what would that be, Mission. Mm -hmm. Mission in 25th. Um, burned down, I think. But I'm wondering when that may have uh, been built and what, uh, what other sorts of entertainment was going on in 1919. So Waters Field is a relative, relatively later addition built out there, and they were considered pro baseball players, but they were minor league as opposed to a major league. Um, but they were paid oftentimes, sometimes in turkeys, which is one of my favorite stories from that. <laughs> um, when, before that, Salem had another team called the Senators and then other names there. And they actually played at a place called Biddle Field. And this would have been probably around the turn of the 20th century. And that was um, out on near U Park. So if you're going down 12th Street, south on 12th Street, and you pass what is now called U Park, and you keep going to about where Howard Street would come out if Howard Street came out, that's about where Biddle Field was. Um, and they played there for a long time. This, they were called the Salem Raglins for a while, the Salem Senators, um, and then they went away, and then they came back again and got affiliated with um, professional teams. They started out as an affiliate of the Dodgers and then changed to the Angels and then to the Giants with what they are today. And obviously different teams come and go during that point in time. Um, but yeah, baseball was a long, long-term thing that was happening here in Salem. In fact, the first baseball game we know about, this is probably more than you ever wanted to know, but we just did an exhibit on baseball about four years ago, so I learned a lot more than I wanted to know about Salem baseball. Um, the first game was played between Willamette University and a group from the city of Salem, and it was actually behind the courthouse, so the old courthouse, oh, there's a picture. <laughs> the old courthouse had some grassy areas behind it. 
um, towards this area. And that's where the first game was played in the city of Salem. And I want to say it was about 1871-ish. Don't quote me on that. Um, there's been some great uh, research that's been done, and, and um, I can get to that if you want more specific details. For a historian, I have a hard time with dates. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> All kind of is floating around up there. Any more questions? A lot of our people are, are transplants from New York or Alabama or someplace. I don't know. <laughs> so they don't have that sense of history. <laughs> Excuse me. I think that's a good segue into my suggesting to any of you that are interested that over at Willamette Heritage, there's a collection of books or publications, I should call them, called Marion County History. There are 15 volumes of that, and some of those go back, uh, they were put together back in the 50, 1950s, and the information goes back as far as anybody has done research on Salem, Willamette University, the uh, missionaries or whomever, uh, each of those should have an index. Uh, if they don't, there's a general index for the whole set. But anytime you've got questions about Salem, particularly, and the general vicinity, then Marion County history would be the volumes to peruse. And I know, and just so I acknowledge that I know you are an author on some of those as well, I think. Is that right? Yeah, and they're really well researched. We have had a volunteer create a master index now for all of the volumes, so instead of having to look in different volumes, um, there's one master index on our website that's searchable now, too, which is great. Hi, uh, this is Anne. Hi, Anne. <laughs> um, when did the city directories uh, begin printing? So the earliest one that we have a copy of is from 1867, and then the next one is 1871, and then the next one is 1880, and then I start getting a little more fuzzy. Um, but then it's not every year. They may have been published every year, but we do have some gaps in our collection. Um, but yeah, the earliest one I've seen is 1867 for the city of Salem. Hi, this is Janet. I'm just curious of this group, who's lived in Salem the longest? What Ooh, okay, so you want to do it this way? George was born here in 48, but so who can beat that? So who's been here 20 years? Raise your hand. Who's been here 30 years? Leave your hand up. Oh, I can leave my hand up. I've been here 30 years. <laughs> who's been here 40 years? 50 years? 60 years? Oh, well, got a couple in the back. 70 years? Do you want to admit it? <laughs> I stand corrected. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a lot of good roots in here. 70, do I need to go long, longer? 80? 76, all right. <laughs> wow. Good history. Good history. Well, I think this might be a good time to take a, a break. Um, I don't know when we normally come back. Maybe someone can yell it out. Um, 10 minutes. 10 minute break? It's hard stretch. to figure out because it's a, between the big I'm going to stretch. I'm going to drink. All right, so I really wanted for the second part of the presentation to go outside and walk around um, and keep you all awake. But we're going to do it virtually instead. Um, sorry. <coughs> Woo, here we go. All right. So uh, we're going to take a, I know you've been sitting all for a while, but we're going to take a nice leisurely, leisurely walk through time. Um, I love what I do, but it does come with a little bit of a curse. Uh, when I'm researching day in and day out, I start getting visions. Unfortunately, for my ability to win the lottery, these are not visions of the future. These, unfortunately, are visions of the past. <laughs> um, and it's kind of fun, though, be able to walk around different places and see different history things. So I'm going to try to do that for you now uh, with a wide variety of sources uh, to talk about the history of this place. I think the history of place is really important, not just in giving you a sense of, of where you are and where we're going, um, but also in terms of long-term decision making um, and, and the effects that that might have, too. So um, I know you all come here twice a week. and. I'm trying to judge how much you really know about what happened here in this place. Um, so warm up your mind's eye a little bit, and we're going to take a virtual walk around the block. 
So just to get you all ready, we are about here. Yes, everybody good? We are looking on this view. This way is north. And we're going to take a little bit of a walk. We're going to start out along Mill Street. We're going to take a left onto 12th Street. Then we're going to take a left onto the imaginary Bellevue that at one point in time it did actually go through and then return up on 14th Street. So got that all kind of locked in your brain? <laughs> all right, here we go. So we're going to start here in this building. Does anybody know what was here? See? Tell you, you guys are good. <laughs> so if we're looking south now, this direction towards the building we're in here, um, here's another view from about 1984. We're going to focus on this building right here, which, as was stated earlier, is a cannery. Um, oops, that was good. But it didn't start out as a cannery. It started out as the Southern Pacific Corporation, the railroads, hop warehouse. Places where hops, as we've talked about before, were big, big business. Um, uh, were sent to be then shipped to other places um, on, on the Southern Pacific line that went through there. And the building abutted the, the main line of the Southern Pacific, which is still today where it was at that point in time, although it's down to one track instead of two at that point. So here's what Del Monte or Calpac cannery looked like in about 1984. Um, the California Packing Corporation, or Calpac for short, took over from the Oregon Packing Company, uh, which had been leasing that uh, warehouse from the Southern Pacific for many years. Um, but it's also often commonly called the Del Monte cannery because Del Monte was a big brand of uh, Calpac. And uh, if you see in this picture here, oh, I didn't circle it, but there's. the good old Del Monte red symbol uh, right on top of there too. Um, yeah, so canning was a huge business, uh, this being an agricultural center for a lot of fruits and vegetables and other things, it's a lot. Um, fruits and vegetables become a lot more shelf stable when you can can them and send them other places. Um, and so your selling season's a little bit bigger than, than just the, the initial things as well. Especially in these days when we don't have the necessarily the refrigerated cars that would come later um, and it's a little bit more expensive to ship that way. Um, so this is Cal Pack looking from where the passenger station is today, looking that would be east across the railroad tracks, give you kind of a scale and scope of how big this building actually was. And just keep in mind for a little bit later, this thing right here, we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. So just keep that one in, in, in the back of your brain. So if we start looking north across Mill Street, oh, I thought I could do this, this is not gonna work at all, but we'll figure it out. So if we're standing here, boo, 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 and we look north, across Mill Street, kind of, oh, I want to be down the street a little bit. Wee, wee, is that one of you guys there? I don't know. <laughs> Somebody's a little late for the lecture. <laughs> all right, <laughs> so, so, all right, so we're looking north across Mill Street, and what do we see? Well, hopefully we see this is going to be a great idea, but hopefully we see these lovely red buildings kind of in the background. Um, this is, of course, where I work <laughs> at the Willamette Heritage Center. Um, most recently, uh, this was operating as the Thomas K. Woolen Mill, which, given its title, I think you all can understand, was a mill that made woolens. <laughs> Not super um, uh, difficult to come up with that, what, what the product was there. Um, this is what the building looked like. Uh, probably about 1905 after the new structure was built. Uh, originally there was a wooden structure here that served as the mill um, operations. Mm, mill operations and fire don't usually go hand in hand, so they got smart and rebuilt it in brick as they went through after a big fire came through. Um, the Thomas K. Woolen Mill operated in this space from 1889 to 1962. Uh, the only finished products that were ever made at the Thomas K. Woolen Mill were Blankets, yes. Uh, they made a lot of fabric that was sold wholesale to other uh, manufacturers of garments. Um, uh, the White Stag Company out of Portland was a big uh, purchaser because wool was the ultimate sportswear up until synthetic fibers came in. If you're going doing outdoor stuff, you want wool because cotton kills and wool has a special um, fiber with the structures. Um, it's able to insulate even when it's wet. So it's, it's a good thing. <laughs> 
Um, but the industry really took a big nosedive after uh, World War II when synthetic fibers like nylon and polyester became being um, made in, in, in wholesale much greater strengths. So the, the mill was closed in 1962 for, for good. But it was not the first mill to be on that site. In fact, the first mill was called the Pioneer Oil Company, which was started in the 1860s, ran through the 1870s, and actually the Thomas K. Woolen Mill took over the turbine of the Pioneer Oil Company and some other things. They were all attracted because of this beautiful stream that runs right through our site and was the main power source for all of these mills, uh, running a turbine that would run all of the line shafts and then the machinery as well. Does anybody have any idea what the Pioneer Oil Company was manufacturing? Pioneers, I like it, I like it. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, Rob, but that actually would be an actual answer that I would get from some of my tours that I give. You know, Pioneers, obviously. <laughs> Although they're sometimes fourth graders, so I don't know. <laughs> um, says the fourth grade teacher too, right? <laughs> So Pioneer Oil Company was manufacturing linseed oil. Linseed oil comes from the flax plant, and it's the seeds that are then pressed. And there were actually two products that came out of this, both the linseed oil that could be used in paint manufacturing. Uh, it was a base for a lot of the early paints that were being used, but also the mash that comes out of the kind of, after you've pressed the oils out and you've got this mash stuff, was sold as a feed additive for agricultural purposes in livestock. So it's actually a really great business model, um, but they went belly up and got bought out and there you go. Now we got Thomas K. Woolen Mill <laughs> there. Um, so actually there is one thing that survived from the Pioneer Woolen Mill, or Pioneer Oil Mill, and that's this building that's sitting right there. It doesn't stand today, but we still have some foundations down there along the creek, so you can go take a look at them if you're ever walking around on the grounds there. Um, but this site also had a greater significance in local history as well. In fact, right about where the water tower stands today, this is the old water tower, the new water tower is in the same spot. This building was built in 1841. This is the Methodist Parsonage, and while we call it the Parsonage, that's kind of a moniker that doesn't quite fit with the original purpose. This building was built to house the teachers of the Oregon Institute, well, actually the Indian Manual Labor Training School, which was the precursor to what would become the Oregon Institute gets complex. The mission school was what this was, was for. So the idea was to bring in Native American children, not just from the Salem area, but from all over the state, uh, to a boarding school where they would be taught by the missionaries. Um, some academic subjects, but also a lot of um, cultural subjects as well. They were teaching farming, they were teaching uh, sewing, and other types of manual labor type skills as well as part of their ministry there. Um, this school, uh, this building housed the teachers of the school building, which was built across the street, about 12 rods away, if anybody's real good at doing measurement old-timey style. <laughs> so a rod is actually an actual rod measurement. Um, yeah, 12 rods away. I've never measured it myself. Um, but this was located about where Smullen Hall is today, if you're familiar with Willamette's campus. In fact, if you go walking out there, look for a big rock. <laughs> And that rock is actually mar marking the corner of this building, which stood for many years. You can see it here in the 1868 photo. Um, I can circle this one so it's here. This is hopefully recognizable. Here. <laughs> um, and it was the first building that then Willamette University would take over. Actually, the Oregon Institute would take over, which became the school. It's run by the same people. It gets really complicated. Mindy Mission Manual Training School is what the school was, the building was built for, and then the missionaries started their own school, and rather than sell it to the Catholics, who apparently they had a big feud with, um, they sold it to themselves for less money than they could have made, and then started the school. It's really fascinating. If you ever want to hear that story, I can go in great detail, but we won't do it today. So the parsonage, well, the parsonage was here, was where that water tower was, water tower, parsonage, um, and this was part of what was called the parsonage reserve, part of the property that the missionaries had claimed for themselves personally as um, land claim, land claimants with a donation land, donation land claim because the mission as a corporation couldn't do it themselves, so they had this agreement that they worked out all among themselves. Um, so in addition to removing the parsonage back from its 
a uh, place that it got moved after the, the linseed oil factory got put together. As buildings in Salem of historic significance started coming up, um, in derelict kind of states. This is the Jason Lee house as it looked when it was on Broadway Street after it turned into basically an apartment building <laughs> for many years. Um, citizens from the city of Salem and volunteers decided that they wanted to find a place to put these. Um, there were lots of things that were thought up. Where should we, where should we put these? Um, uh, Marion Square Park was considered, the fairgrounds were considered, but finally a siting survey decided, hey, we've got this place. Most of them are already stored over on this woolen mill ground property. The woolen mill's going belly up, so let's start a, a museum institution, and that's how Mission Mill Association was formed. Uh, Marion County Historical Society was a big player in that at the time, um, and they uh, merged about 10 years ago now, oh my gosh, 10 years ago in 2010, and became the Willamette Heritage Center. So that was more than you probably wanted to know about that, but there you go. Oh, there's Jason Lee House, which is the oldest single family, no, is the oldest frame structure still standing in the Pacific Northwest today. And this is what it looked like, um, probably about 1858. I think that's the Kuchel and Drexel year, 53, 58, I'm not sure. And this is how it looked when it was getting moved here, stripped down. And this is what it looks like today. Yay, a lot better. So the Thomas K. Woolen Mill in and of itself did not take up the whole five acres that you see when you look across the street over there. In fact, it only took up about half of it. You see the little, little line here? This was the edge of the property. And most of what is now our parking lot was a field and some other things. So you can see it a little bit better in this area. Here's where the parking lot became. It's still a field in 1984. There it is. Yes, I see it. <laughs> But there are some other things that were in that parking lot area. So if you're looking across Mill Street, you can see this space. Actually, there were railroad houses, railroad housing that was there. So there were three structures there. The families um, and individuals lived there um, that were working for the Southern Pacific Railroad. And I'm very excited to have found this photograph from 1943 showing those structures that were there for probably they come in, we see them in the 1915 uh, Sanborn map, so we know they were built by then, but I don't know exactly when they were built. But I'm very excited because last Friday, I actually got to sit down with the gentleman on the left <laughs> who grew up in those houses with his father, who's seen here, his name is Pablo Martinez. Uh, Mr. Martinez was born in Lima, Peru, and immigrated, actually he joined the Merchant Marines from Peru, and then got off the boat in Astoria in about 1923 made his way up to Alaska for some fishing, and then joined with the Southern Pacific Railroad, where he worked for 48 years, living many of them in the house right there. And I'm very excited that very soon when you walk across the street, you'll see a sign <laughs> that talks about not only Mr. Martinez and his family, but also some of the other um, Mexican-American uh, track workers that lived in that space. Um, and I'm very excited about it. So, little plug for coming soon to a street corner near you. So railroads, in addition to having houses across the street, were really important in this little square of block that we're going through. Um, I don't know how well you can see it, but all of the dotted lines in this picture are rail lines. So we have the main line of the Southern Pacific. Uh, we have a spur line going off down, mm, that would be Ferry Street, Trade Street, Ferry Street, Trade Street, Ferry Street, I think Ferry. Ferry Street. And then we have the streetcar lines as well, going up and down 12th Street and down State Street. And over there. It's a little tall. Man, my picture looks different than yours. Huh, okay. Um, yeah, so keep in mind, rail is really important in this area. You can see some of that there in this picture as well. I think I circled something. Ah, yeah, so at the corner, as we're walking down Mill Street, and we look a little bit to the right, um, you'll see, well, you won't see now because they're not there, but these were uh, sheds that were used by the Southern Pacific for housing equipment and other things that might be needed for the maintenance of the railroad. They're not there anymore, but they were there at that point in time. You can see them in this picture here. I don't know if I circled them or not. I did, yay! <laughs> Standing there, again, you can see Del Monte in the back of that circle and the rail, sh the rail sheds as well. And a beautiful steam engine barreling its way, full head of steam coming this direction north on the tracks. You can also see the little curvy track that doesn't exist anymore, but existed for a long time. Does anybody remember that track going cutting through Willamette's campus? <laughs> I do. My dad does. <laughs> he hasn't been in Salem all that long. He remembers having to cross the, the tracks to get to class and moving around <laughs> at that time. 
Um, so rail was super important to the Thomas K. Woolen Mill. We had a spur that came out. You see that? You really see it? <laughs> Try to make it work. Um, the blue line uh, was a spur that came off and uh, fed the hog fuel. Uh, the mill actually ran off of a boiler in some instances, and they burned hog fuel that came in from the sawmills or closer to the river, and they brought it up on a rail car, moved the rail car off, dumped the hog fuel out. Um, and they also sent it to this lovely big building here. which powered state capital and other state buildings. It was a big boiler, uh, added steam, so a lot of the heating um, elements that were going through the, the, the capital itself come from the steam plant that was there. Side, side note. Um, we also, on the spur for the Thomas K. Woolen Mill, at one point in time, got ourselves a caboose. Um, but it didn't really make a whole lot of sense because this caboose didn't come from anywhere around here, so it was a short-lived time until one day, in the wilds of Eugene, a caboose was found. <laughs> and this caboose was special because, well, this is what the caboose used to look like before it made it to the wilds of Eugene, because we were able to find documentation of Caboose 507 and know from all of the different um, statements on this card of inventory that it ran on the tracks that sit right outside of our, our area here. So there you go. We've got a 1909 caboose made for the Oregon and California Railroad, intact, beautiful, and with provenance to here, well, we've got to get a caboose. <laughs> so we did the impossible. I didn't think this was actually going to ever happen <laughs> when people brought this up to me, but it did. Um, got it out of the wilds of Eugene, moved uh, with a crane onto a truck, where it sat in, in here in kind of derelict shape uh, until with the help of many, many, many volunteers, both in terms of time and effort. Some of them are here today. Is anybody here today that's worked on the caboose? Hmm. <laughs> Maybe in the back row there. I won't embarrass you too much. <laughs> um, but in terms of uh, volunteer hours, they've been working solidly for two years to get this um, to the shape that it's in now. And in terms of work, we had, yeah, um, it, it was in pretty bad shape. So it's now looking lovely. And next year, which will celebrate the 150th anniversary of rail service coming to Salem in September, we are planning on opening this up to the public with a full exhibit about what train life was like on there. So I'm very excited about that. And thank you to all those that have helped, not only in terms of their time and talents in an industrial sense, but also um, their creative sense as well. Is Wesley here today? Are, are you here? Yeah. Who also contributed a beautiful poem to celebrating, um, celebrating the arrival of the caboose, too. So thank you for that. It's cherished. <laughs> so really great volunteers. They're awesome. If you want to know more about it, you can ask any of the people in the back here. <laughs> um, I'm sure this picture was put on for a reason. I don't remember what it was, other than it shows that beautiful, uh, spur, or, uh, beautiful um, Y coming in off the main line there onto Willamette University's campus, which you can also see in this picture with my beautiful drawing onto that area. Um, Willamette University, as we're walking along 12th Street, now a lot of 12th Street on the west side, uh, looks like Willamette University prop property, but that was not always the case. In fact, early on, Willamette stopped about there, where the creek was running through it and the train tracks on Ferry Street. Um, if Just to give you perspective, this is, what is it? Eaton. Eaton. That's Eaton Hall. Um, this is? Gym. Is the gym, which is now the Playhouse, the Kresge Theater, uh, or M. Lee Pelton Theater. I'm showing my age, sorry. We've changed names again, I will get there. <laughs> Um, but it was originally served as a gymnasium, but now it's the theater building. So that's the end of Willamette University's property. Um, the stuff behind there are houses and industrial buildings in this area. Oh my, yeah, in that area right there, which we're going to look at as we walk down 12th Street. So the first item on the list about where the Spark Center is today was the Oregon Packing Company, another cannery that stood there for very many years with that railroad spur coming in it. Another view of it there. Right next to it was the lumber company, the Falls City Salem Lumber Company. Um, there were many lumber yards that stood there over time, um, including the Capital Lumber Company. I also just appreciated this advertisement for many reasons. Um, 
bringing people together over paint, oils, and lumber. Um, and also, my favorite find of yesterday, right next door to that lumber company on 12th Street, where the, about where the, mm, just north of where the football field is, where Spark Center is. Anybody read it? Patent Medicine Factory. I looked for hours yesterday to see if I could figure out more about this Patent Medicine Factory because I was intrigued, but no such luck. I haven't found anything yet, but stay tuned. When I find it, I'm gonna write an article about it because I'm just really interested. Oh, it could be. It could be pat, but, but the word patent medicine makes me think it's probably a distillery because most patent medicines were, let's, be face, let's face it, alcohol. <laughs> so I don't know if it was maybe a way, maybe a secret distillery in Prohibition Salem. I don't know. There's a story to be told somewhere. I'm going to find it. <laughs> Is there a winery there too? We're getting there. You're getting, you're getting ahead of me here. We've got to get to 14th Street first. <laughs> So this is a view of 12th Street, looking south. You can see the Capitol, orient yourself, and the uh, lumber yard and the patent medicine factory are here on the north side of what would be, 12th, or would be Mill Street going across, which is now the north edge of the football field. Mm, I got in trouble for this yesterday. Soccer field. My European is showing. <laughs> um, uh, going southwards into now the soccer field area uh, was Tallman Piano Store. Um, I also just love this article and advertisement that it must be sold at once. We'll take your old piano, phonograph, radio, or organ at first payment. Balance like rent. I don't know, you can pay it in installments maybe? I don't know. Um, at Tallman Piano Store at 395 South 12th Street. I don't have a picture of the store itself, but you can kind of see it in this view on 12th Street looking south. Um, you can orient yourself to the... 12th Street there, and if you look really close, I'm not sure if you can read it, it does say pianos right there. Pianos right there. Um, yeah, moving down the street, there's a sign, which is really hard to see in this fuzzy photo, it says Motel. The next um, building down was a restaurant and con confectionery with a hotel on top. Let me tell you, this must have been the shadiest corner in Salem. There's a lot of fun newspaper articles that come out of this address. First, it starts out with this, a good business for sale or trade, depot, cafe, confectionery, rooms, and living rooms. It's a money maker, and for quick transfer, we'll sell or trade my equity for anything of value. <laughs> good terms, investigate it. Inquire at the depot cafe at South 12th Street, Salem, Oregon. Well, that sounds like a positive start to this uh, business venture, right? Well, then you get this next article. Advertising for equity in a 1936 Plymouth Coupe. Call it the Depot Cafe. How do you get equity in a car? Is this like a ride share, maybe an early ride share? I think something, something shady is going on. They start to, start to hit, hit the ticklers on that one. And then you get to the suspension of licenses for Mrs. Bertha Russell. She may be my new favorite character in Salem history. Just wait. So you start to see these... Um, these suspensions of licenses. I swear, she must have had at least 13 suspensions of licenses in the 10 years that she's there. I don't know how she's operating business at all, but she's selling to minors and intoxicated persons and maintaining a disorderly establishment. It gets worse for Bertha. Oops, maybe it does. Oh no, you can't see it. Oh, I wonder if I can fix it. Oh no. There we go. Can you see it? Ah. Uh, well, I, I messed up passport, or uh, per, yeah, for somehow. But the bookie ring indicated an under arrest. So there's this huge front page article about Bertha Russell, who now has a moniker, Big Bertha, <laughs> who gets arrested as being part of this conspiracy. And they're running schemes on football games and horse racing. And they're selling tickets and other things. I'm not sure, I'm not very good at gambling. But um, yeah, it's really exciting. Um, and then, of course, I had to learn more about Big Bertha because who doesn't want to know about Big Bertha? It turns out she eventually moves to Reno, not Las Vegas, or Las Vegas, Las Vegas, Nevada, and dies, unfortunately, at the age of 60 of coronary um, heart attack. So anyway, she's pretty interesting. I'm sure there will be more coming about her. Um, next door to Bertha's establishment is a beauty parlor um, where you can get some interesting permanent raves and other things. 
Um, and then you have uh, uh, houses. I'm not sure if I can. Yeah. So, oh, nope. How do I get there? Nope. Other direction. Come back. There we go. So as we go down the, the rest of the block there towards Bellevue Street, which is now the parkway, um, you see a lot of residential areas. And they weren't as good a story, so I just didn't include them. And I don't have any pictures of them. So we finally make it down to Bellevue and oops, Bellevue and 12th Street, where the Ram now stands. Turns out there was a tavern there for quite a long time. Huh? Waltz. Waltz Tavern, yeah, <laughs> Waltz Tavern. But you know, the more you look into the Waltz history, here is his, his obituary that says he started his tavern there in 1936. But when you go back to the 1936 city directory and the Sanborn map and look at it, it wasn't a tavern. It was a service station. And somehow in between 1936 and when he passes away in, the 19, in 1961, it transforms into this tavern. And it's, there's even advertisements in the middle where he's doing both. He's also servicing your cars and selling alcohol out of the tavern. So it sounds like a really great place <laughs> as he goes through there. And of course, uh, the area then would become, I think it's the Hofbrau Tavern and other things too, on its way to becoming the Ram. And then we're going to cross across the street to the Amtrak station, which didn't always look as beautiful as it did today. Evidence here. It looks a lot nicer than it has in a long time. Um, this station was built in 1918, so it's about celebrating its 101st an first anniversary here. Um, before that, there was a, a large um, wooden structure that took over it, although you can see a portion of that wooden structure now in the new Greyhound um, building that's across the way. Um, I just, this is the one place where people took a lot of pictures, so I included a lot of pictures, <laughs> but it's a fun to see the different activities going on there. Um, as I go through, uh, this was a hub not just for passenger trains on the Southern Pacific, but also through the street railway car. This one showing the street railway cars that are being pulled by horses as opposed to um, electrical systems that they would later become. Um, oh, and I already showed you this picture. I, I love that skunk car, let me tell you. <laughs> um, and this is the Daylight, which is my other favorite train, so it got here too. But you can also see in the back of this picture the cannery on the other side, uh, looking through there. And this one's pretty cool because you can see the Capitol building in the background. It also hosted a number of celebrities, including um, RFK in 1968 or three. I can see it in my head, eight, great. Right before he was shot um, on the same trip, 68. Um, and just to be fair and partisan on both sides, <laughs> Ike <laughs> um, with uh, McNary um, with him as well. So we're going to take a quick strip across from the passenger depot um, across the way over what would be Bellevue Street if Bellevue Street sort of went through there over to 14th Street to finish out our block tour. Well, that's fun. Where we would probably run right into a cattle corral. That's right. <laughs> it's a place to put cattle before you put them on the train. Who knew? This is probably about where um, just north of the softball fields over on 14th Street. As we move up, we hit what is now the parking lot area for TIUA, but was Honeywood. Honeywood Winery. There you go. So before Honeywood Winery moved down there, um, their facilities were right along 14th Street. Um, yeah, and there's just we found this great brochure that shows some of the packaging, um, and I just think it's fascinating photos as you go through <laughs> of the, the production there and the um, sale to folks all over the country too. All right. And with that, then we walk through a little bit more residential to return right back to the place we started. And that's all I have prepared. <laughs> I like that picture. So did anything surprise you? Yes! You guys are hard to trick, so I don't know. Usually I have an easier audience to work with. <laughs> Were there, were there questions or, okay. On your opening photo, there was a lot of snow. Do you have uh, decent weather uh, data from way back then? 
Not a whole lot. People tend to take pictures when it snows a lot, so I kind of have uh, clusters when? <laughs> of when there was a big snow in 1919. Um, there was also a, another record-breaking snow, and I wrote an article about it maybe a year and a half ago. I'll have to pull it out because I don't remember exactly the year, but they got something like three feet within a day, and it was the most snow they'd ever recorded, and it just messed everything up. <laughs> but it's a great, great, great read and a great story. I can get you the information if you want. Columbus Day Storm, which is coming, uh, I guess the next anniversary is coming up in a couple of years. But yeah, that's about, about this time of year, too. Um, biggest storm. Great stories there. Probably some memories around here, too, from that. Yeah. Uh, I'm Jeanette. Thank you for your presentation. In the first half, you talked a little bit about, uh, Oh, I forget what you called the school on the Willamette campus, the American school, or so the there. Well, anyway, the, it was yeah, it was training? a school for for white children. Okay, that would be the Oregon Institute. Okay, mm -hmm. and then in the second half, you mentioned something about the um, like trade school for the Native Americans. So I've always heard more of an emphasis of of the fact that uh, missionaries came to provide a school for the Native Americans. And uh, so, so what is the real story here? Uh, I, mean, I mean, it seems kind of complicated and it's being told in different ways. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How much time we got, right? You keep me honest on the time here. So yes, when the missionaries came in 1834, they started their mission 14 miles north of here at what's now Willamette Mission State Park, and they started a school called the Indian Manual Labor Training Institute. When they moved to Salem, because their first spot that they picked, surprise, surprise, was not super great because they didn't know the lay of the land, um, and everybody was getting malaria and getting super sick, they decided to move inland away from the river and ended up in Salem. At that point in time, they created, they moved their school from there, which was a, a training school, manual labor training school for Native Americans in this area to what's now Willamette University's campus and built that building that we saw a picture of, the Oregon Institute building is what it's called. Um, in 1842, everybody moved there, that's where it was. And the school uh, served as kind of a gathering point for most people because it was the biggest building in the area at the time, so they did a lot of other things there. They had meetings there and other things. And in fact, they held the first church services there as well. That's beside the point. So by about 1842, most of the missionaries can see the lay of the land, and they can see that their stated purpose to be an Indian mission was probably coming to an end. Um, they started to see the opening up of the Oregon Trail, a lot more uh, Anglo-American settlers coming in to the area, and they decided to start a school of their own that would be a, a school of, of academic teaching. And that's when they find the Oregon Institute in 1842. They pick out a place in Kaiser um, for, to build the school in. And before they get the school put together, um, everybody subscribes money and does the whole thing you do when you're building a school. Um, the mission is closed. So um, they've got to divest. The mission then is divesting itself of, of, of interests and this private school that's been brought together needs a place needs a building so they get this bright idea well why don't we just sell ourselves this property which would become Wyoming University's campus and so they do um, cutting out the Catholics that we we're offering a whole lot more money for it um, at the time and where did I go with that at that point in time which would be at least 1844 or afterwards it becomes the Oregon Institute property so the property is the same but the the institutions are two different institutions, if that makes sense. But I take a little bit of, um, I contradict a little bit Willamette's founding of 1842 uh, date, because they, they, they date their founding in 1842 to the beginning of the Oregon Institute, which didn't get built or put into a building until 1844, even though they signed the documents for it, and did not get chartered as a university until the 1850s. So, but I mean, 1842 sounds good, and I guess you can claim it. It goes back to Lee's question, like, when did Salem actually start? Well, how technical do you want to get <laughs> as it goes through there? But the Oregon Institute is the founding institution for Willamette University, not the Indian Manual Labor Training School. 
Hi, this is Don. The, uh, the Wayne's question on the snow uh, reminded me of an of ICL uh, history uh, story. Most of, uh, lots, of, lots of you remember Francis Allen, who we lost a few years ago. Francis came to class one day in February, it had snowed, and he says, do any of you remember the, the snow of Valentine's Day, 1937? And of course, you know, uh, most of us hadn't been born yet in 1937. Anyway, so Wayne, it could have been 1937. That's a good one. Yeah, they're great stories of the Willamette freezing over and people going out and swimming, or not swimming, skating. <laughs> swimming would be bad, skating on the top of it. Great stories. Yes. Uh, could you share a few things about maybe the Willamette River, you know, how it might have been affected the city, I mean Salem? Sure. Like, did they have commerce here, or was there ever used for passengers? I know that there was a ferry boat or something that was here at one time that yeah. landed in Salem. So Ferry Street is aptly named because at the foot of Ferry Street was the ferry <laughs> that would take you to the other side of the, the river. Um, steamboats were plying the Willamette, Univer Willamette University, man, I'm getting tired, Willamette River up until the 1930s and 40s, still um, using goods. So uh, steamboats were used to bring freight and passengers up and down from, from Portland and the Columbia River and, and other points in between. In fact, the missionaries, when they first came down, often took canoes down the river because river became this, this highway. Um, there were no roads at the time, there were trails, but um, this was the most efficient way to move people even if you had to get out in portage around places like Oregon City where there's pretty significant uh, falls. Uh, you wouldn't want to take a boat over there before the dams were put in. Um, so they would portage around the falls and then come down, um, oftentimes with Native American guides that knew the rivers pretty well because there was a lot of transportation along there um, even prior to Anglo-American settlement in the area. So yes, uh, uh, s connection to the river was really important in terms of getting industry out. And you see this when the railroad starts coming in in the 1870s. Towns that were along the river that had been the big shipping points to take grain and other things out start uh, changing their character a little bit. They're, while stuff is still moving, um, the rail uh, starts building a new set of towns. And then you see it again with the roads coming in, How how towns that were bypassed from the roads to the rail change again. So yeah, there's definitely a migration along those travel routes as far as economy and, and population goes. Is that what you were looking for? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. In, de in defense of McNary, back here, in defense I mean, of McNary, <laughs> of Willamette, uh -huh. um, at ICL we had a wonderful presentation by someone from Willamette, Good. and I don't know the name offhand, but she gave a wonderful presentation of the history and acknowledged a lot of the things that you brought up about the two different schools and also the problem with the date. So they recognize that that is not the date and we should give them credit for that. Definitely, that's good. Oh, uh, Paul over here. Thank you. Yeah, what struck me on the pictures is that it looked like a lot of this area here along the railroad tracks, a lot of that was sort of developed in the early um, 20th century. You know, the buildings were old and it stayed relatively static um, in terms of the railroad lines and, and, the, and the canneries. But it looks like in the 60s, suddenly there was this massive redevelopment of the area. You know, there's the hospital and Lamette University. Do you, what were the drivers in the city at that time that maybe caused that? Urban redevelopment funds. Um, after post-war area, when you get to about the 1960s, that becomes a really big thing. They're looking at um, the, the I know. I am not an urban planner, I am not, this is not my area of expertise, so I'm gonna go on things that I've been told <laughs> on that. Um, but there are funds now available in an urban renewal development fund, both federal and local funds that are able to look at the problem, problem, the issue of people fleeing inner city areas and moving out to suburbs out of that area and redeveloping those areas, which was considered a, a policy decision at the time. Um, this is also something that 
uh, prompts a lot of the historic preservation uh, legislation we see on a federal level. Um, the National Historic Preservation Act is passed at this point in time in direct response to a lot of um, the development that's going on in terms of urban renewal, but also in terms of big freeways that oftentimes are cutting through historic districts um, and changing the character of those areas. Um, so you see a lot of that legislation that creates the National Register of Historic Places and other um, things aimed at uh, preserving the historic fabric of these downtown areas. So I think there's a lot of things going on in Salem in particular though, my understanding is that a lot of this um, urban renewal and growth monies that are going in, you see a lot of the development that's happening uh, from the Civic Center to like the Mill Race Plaza and all of that stuff. Uh, Ferry Street was an industrial kind of backwater. Um, Riverfront Park, we kind of see it moving <laughs> that direction. Riverfront Park in general was industrial mixed use area and the paper plant was there and it expanded a lot more than there. It was a lot of rundown apartment buildings, <laughs> houses and other things in that space. And at this point in time, you see it kind of leveled and cleaned off um, towards, towards that area, maybe a little later towards that until you get an agreement um, to create the park that's there today. But it looks a lot different. I can do another presentation on the time of the changing of Riverfront Park because I find that one fascinating as well. Um, so I'm not sure if I hit, hit what you're looking for, but um, that's where I was where I would guess. I see Ed, I see, oh, thank you. I was just going to say my husband's grandparents lived in Independence, and um, she would take, his grandmother would take my, my father-in-law to school uh, to Willamette on the boat, and they moved up there, left, my, her, left his grandfather home in Independence, and then they moved to uh, Portland, where he could go to school right now. I can't remember this school, but that's where he studied for four years and then came back to work in Independence. Oh, so, cool. <laughs> just mentioned, you know, what happened on the river, so I just wanted to mention it. Uh, Boat. You. River there, and there was, there was an inner urban line that went down to that direction. My favorite story about taking the train down that way to, there's a station called Finzer, a station, so, differentiation between station and depot. Depot has a place where you stop and there's like a waiting room and that type of thing. A, a station is just a point on the, the, the map and I think Fencer was just a point on the map. But the people that were going to go golfing at Illahi Golf Course down um, where it is today, well it was in a little bit of a different place, but they would take, take this inner urban and they'd get off and then they'd climb with their clubs up the top of the hill to go golfing. I just thought that was a fantastic story. Um, but towards independence, transportation stories are great. Uh, this is Ed right here. Hi, Ed. <laughs> uh, you have located the uh, the benefits and the enthusiastic programs for members of Willamette Heritage Center, and I won't go into them, but I say they are they are fantastic. You can't afford to not join. Thank this you again for all the right benefits. <laughs> members of the Willamette Heritage Society enjoy, and I, I uh, urge you to look into it. It's very affordable, and like I say, lots of good things happen to members. I didn't even plant Ed on that one, I swear. <laughs> that was all him. But yeah, uh, I thank you, and thank you for supporting, supporting the Heritage Center. We're a nonprofit. We're not owned by the city. We're doing, doing this work that direction, so thank you. This is Ann. Hi, Ann. What are your sources for all these wonderful old pictures? Um, uh, the majority of the photos, not all of them, but the majority of them are from our collections at the Willamette Heritage Center. We have about 200,000 photographic images in different mediums that we house and store and take care of, try to index and make accessible to folks. Um, so a lot of them are from the collections. We've developed collections over the years from various sources. Most of them are private donations. People have collections of photos in their, um, their, their belongings and they bring them to us and we're able to, to house and, and do that. Um, sometimes we come from commercial sources. One of my favorite collections is actually from the Chamber of Commerce when they were cleaning out one of their, their, um, their closets. We got a whole bunch of stuff and, and they took pictures of things that I wanted to see that I hadn't seen before. Not everybody does that. Oftentimes you just have to look for them in the background and that type of thing. Um, but yeah, that's where most of the photos in this collection came from, or the, the screen. Hi, it's Grant back okay. here. Uh, I just want to say something about, you've, you've talked a lot about the rail lines. 
I want to just add one thing to that. Uh, <clears throat> when I came to Willamette in 1967, we had a uh, rail line right through campus. It uh, went down to some factories and other things down towards, uh, well, towards the river from campus. And it would actually, a train would come right through the middle of campus every now and then. It was kind of interesting. <laughs> and you might remember in 76, there was a bicentennial train that had a museum uh, associated with it. That train sat right in the middle of the campus between what's now the Putnam University Center and uh, and the and the mill race. Uh, <laughs> sat right there for about a week. I don't remember exactly how many days, but that's where the museum train was. And then finally, Willamette got with the help of Mark Hatfield, uh, got that track removed. Uh, there were pictures of Mark Hatfield out there symbolically pulling out <laughs> the, the rails. Anyway, I just thought I'd add that to the fact that that train is, was here until the 60s, That's awesome. chugging yeah. about once every two days or so right through campus. <laughs> Watch where you're going. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kylie, for a wonderful afternoon. I think we're going to cut off the questions here Great. and um, let you go. But uh, it's been wonderful, and I hope sometime you can come back again. Thank you. I'd love it. Thank you for the opportunity.